black Christian pastors, Roman Catholic reverends, CIA informants, and the United States Army were all co-conspirators. It's the United States government in one. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and his close friend Ralph Abernathy, along with the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, created and founded an organization called the Poor People's Campaign on May 12, 1968. The campaign's sole intent was a multi-racial effort to gain economic justice for poor Americans. People just don't know, but it's really hard. Not only me, it's so many more in the same shape. I'm not the only one. There's just so many of us right around. Just know how she was flowing. He's naked and home. Five times you have to cook your and pinto beans morning down in the south. You don't know what else get a good meal. You all are ready to be at mine. And I want you to know that you have my moral support. I'm going to be praying for you. I'm going to be coming back to see you. And we are going to be demanding when we go to Washington that something be done and done immediately about these conditions. Dr. King and the SCLC shifted their focus after observing that gains in the Civil Rights Act of 1964 had not improved the material conditions of life for many African Americans. At the very many people have stated that this is the lecture that led to his assassination in April 1968, the same time that was supposedly set for the Poor People's Campaign to go to Washington, D.C. So the organization that mobilized it was essentially decapitated and thrown into chaos about three weeks before it was supposed to happen. Once the Civil Rights Act was completed, the government was through dealing with consciously knowledgeable African Americans like Dr. King. There was never any interest by the government in reconstructing the economy for the benefit of the poor. That is considered to be a big no-no in the United States. This is a capitalist society. It is built on inequality and adversity in many ways. I want to show you a little three-minute clip of the minister that Dr. King was going by his house for dinner. He was due at seven, but they had to move it up for seven to be a little too dark to shoot somebody. So they moved it to six o'clock. Two years ago at a press conference in Memphis, I get a call. And they said, so-and-so, so-and-so is thinking about killing so-and-so, so-and-so. I said, what? He said, well, he said something at a press conference. He said, put him on the phone. I said, whatever you do, get that film. Because once NBC realized what this brother was slipped and said, we will never get our hands on that. What you're fixing to see now went into the evidence in the King trial where they brought a wrongful death suit. And I'll explain that to you quickly in a minute. But what you're fixing to witness now is the, the man who came by to get King to take him to dinner. And 30 years later at a press conference, he slipped because God do baffle your mind. Some of the activities are geared especially for the young uh, who did not have a chance to, to get the feel or to know what the civil rights movement actually was about. Even as they marched, now they could have uh, stopped in a hotel, but when you think about marching from Memphis to Jackson or Jackson to Memphis, that went a hotel. You you stayed in churches, you stayed in people's homes. And and, and that's how we got over, that's how we got through. Uh, the struggle was a very it was a spiritual struggle. You couldn't pay people to do what we had to do. You couldn't pay people to stand before mad dogs and fire hoses and and billy clubs and, and cattle prods. It was strictly uh, a spiritual and moral movement. So we wanted that dimension to be in the pilgrimage to Memphis. We will revisit the mountaintop speech site. That's the Mason's Temple, where Dr. King made his last address, which he almost didn't make, because the night that uh, we were having that rally, there were tornado warnings, and he was behind on the Poor People's Campaign. 
and he said, you guys go on over and have the rally. I'm going to stay at the motel and work on the Poor People's Campaign. When we got there and Dr. Abernathy walked in and Jesse Jackson walked in and I walked in and others, people started clapping because they thought Martin was behind us. And so Ralph's preacher sent, said to him, this is not our crowd. And he went to the phone and called Dr. King and said, any of the marches that, 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 that we had in those days, you have an opportunity to bring the children and bring the family and march with us. And when I finished sharing with them the last hour of Dr. King's life, a hurry. But that gave me the wonderful privilege of spending the last hour on earth. Three preachers in a room, Abernathy, King, and Kyle. And we spent that last hour together in room 306 at the Lorraine Motel. The press is always curious and writers, what went on? What did you talk about? I say, we just talk preacher talk. What preachers talk about when they get together? Yo, hey, Revivals and all the What you fixing to hear now? About a quarter of six, we walked on the balcony, and he was talking to people in the courtyard. He stood here and I stood there. Only as I moved away, so we could have a clear shot, the shot rang out. Thank you. I turned around and then knocked him back on the balcony. Only as I moved away, so we could have a clear shot, the shot rang out. Only as I moved away, so we could have a clear shot, the shot rang out. Thank you. I turned around and then knocked him back on the balcony. Listen. Oh, 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 oh.
And they did a whole session with him telling them how he was involved with the conspiracy and who it was. And then they never ran. So now he's running for his life. So he goes to the King family. And he tells them the same thing that he told ABC. He tells them three times and the fourth time and the young. And they filmed it, they taped it. And he said, I was given a hundred thousand dollars by Frank Liberto, who was the mafia puppet who ran Memphis for the big mafia boys out of New Orleans. So it was Frank Liberto, he said, that gave him $100,000 to set up the whole mechanism for killing King. And the building right behind the Lorraine Hotel with the courtyard bumped into, Lord Jarvis had a record called Jim's Grill. He also said that at the first meeting, here's who was there, so-and-so was there, so-and-so was there. And let me tell you, there was some black folks there too. picture that was leaning over Martin Luther King, Merrill McClellan, he was there at the first meeting. We didn't know at the time his job was to do two things. One was to point everybody in the wrong direction. It was him that pointed and said the shots came from there. Not only was he an undercover cop, he was so undercover that his paycheck didn't even come from the Memphis Police Department, it came from the utility company. And now tonight, as we sit here, he's a CIA. His other job was to infiltrate a little group of little juvenile thugs. They call themselves the invaders. And y'all got to be careful about what y'all join just because they're yelling and screaming about whitey. Y'all got to be careful about what kind of evil, nasty black folk you get around and want to go blow up something and then wonder why you get arrested on your way there. Martin Luther King was preparing for the poor people's march in Washington, D.C. Yeah, many senators and many congress people said, we don't think he should come here because we are afraid of the amount of violence that will be created. Martin Luther King's answer to that was, I've led demonstrations, there's been violence, but it wasn't on our side. It was people attacking us. Now, if I'm going to be blamed for that, then there's something wrong. So they decided that they would create a violent situation. And Merle McClellan, the undercover Memphis cop, had also infiltrated the invaders. And it was when King came in for one day to lead that march. One day. To lead that march. One day. And it was their job to see to it that it broke into a ride so King could no longer say that I've never led a march and led to a ride. And that was to force him to come back for a second march so they could kill him. And so, all at once, the King family decides to sue Lord Jaws on a wrongful death suit. Not that they wanted any money, so the first time the truth could be validated and documented. So there's a lot of people upset about the Truth and Reconciliation Committee in South Africa, but a hundred years from now, because of that, a hundred years from now, nobody has to say, let me tell you what those black folks say they did to them. They can't say that now because white folks came and testified on the oath that this is what we did. Because of this trial, no longer will anybody be able to say, these conspirators alleged this to have happened. 
It's documented under oath. They subpoenaed the, the captain who was over the fire station, which was across the street, firehouse number two from the Lorraine Hotel. 34 years later, he's 34 years older, 70 years old, back, getting ready to die, wanting to find Jesus. So he came and raised his hand and told the truth. Would you give your name? Yes. How old are you? What's your occupation? I'm retired. What was it before you retired? The Memphis Fund. What was your top rank? Battalion commander. Where were you on April the 4th, 1968, when Martin Luther King was shot? He said, I was the, in charge of the fire station across the street from the Lorraine Hotel. Did you notice anything different that day? Yeah, early that morning, some people came and introduced themselves as Army Intelligence. Said they'd like to go up on the roof and put King under surveillance. What'd you do? I led him up to the roof. What'd they have with him? They had large containers, small containers. What do you think was in the containers? I don't know. What do you think? Well, it could have been up to take motion pictures, steel pictures. Say, could the containers held high power right? Yes, they could have. And then what happened? Well, later that day when the shot rang out, they were still on the roof. So we know that the United States government not only had pictures of Martin Luther King being killed, they also had pictures of the person that did it. So then what happened? Say, then I rushed across the street and ran up the steps where King was laying on the ground and I helped put him on the stretcher. Said, did you get to see the wound? Say yes. Would you describe it to the jury? Say the wound was going up. Which means he had been shot from down here, not up there. He's a white man who ran the fire station, who probably 30 some years ago couldn't care if King lived or died. Here's a white man sitting there saying to six blacks and six white jewelry that yes, I saw the wound and the wound went this way. And the next one to testify, testified that he had interviewed people from military intelligence, the 111, the 209. The 209 is so vicious, they were scared of CIA. And the 184, that's the sniper team, that's the Rangers. When they had to admit they was there, they say, well, we was there as a backup and that lead you believe they were talking about to back up in case the security broke down. They was there to back up in case that hit didn't get, they were supposed to take him out. That's what the jewelry heard. Lord John was, defense was real hip. There was so much overwhelming evidence that there was a conspiracy. His defense was, yes, I was part of a conspiracy. I just didn't know the person that I was supposed to have killed was Martin Luther King. And what made that so beautiful, it meant that they couldn't object to none of the stuff that was going because they wanted everybody to know what we knew, that it was a conspiracy. He just didn't know it was Dr. King. 70 witnesses, they got to hear for us to see that film. They got to listen to Earl Clark's wife. Who was Earl Clark? Well, when the shot rang out, the dude who shot took the rifle and gave it to Lord Jowers, and he took it through the back of his restaurant window, and then he jumped over a concrete embankment. And there was a black cab driver, Paul Butler, cab 58. He heard the shot, he didn't know King had been hit. He got out the cab to see what happened. See this white man jumping over this concrete embankment. So he followed him around the corner and watched him get into a police cruiser. That man who shot King was Earl Clark, Memphis cop. Dead now. But they subpoenaed his wife. He 
came to defend the good name of Earl. My husband couldn't have done that because he was homesick all that day. Uh, and what time did he find out Dr. King had been shot? Well, he found out over his police radio. And then what happened? He realized how serious it was that he had to go in. And then what happened? Well, all of his uniforms was in the cleaners. So I had to go get his uniform done. Miss Clark, you aware what time Dr. King was shot? Oh, I, I think it was a little bit after six o'clock. Miss Clark, are you aware that the cleaners closed at five? That's what the jewelry heard. Huh? That's what the jewelry heard. There's an FBI agent by the name of Donald Wilson. He's the one that found the Mustang that Leonie Oswell was driving. He found it in Atlanta. And he found some notes in it that he said the minute he read the notes, he knew it was a conspiracy, but he called one of the numbers, this is 1968, that was on the number, and it ended up going to a nightclub in Dallas that Jack Ruby used to own, and Jack Ruby is the one who killed Lee Harvey Oswell, who was arrested for killing Kennedy. He said he got so scared he never turned it in because he thought if he turned it in and they know he looked at that, they would kill him. This is the FBI. And this is who we have to deal with every day. Those of us out here in the movement have to deal with folks who are a white FBI agent said, I didn't turn this stuff in, because that I turned it in, it probably would have killed me. Hmm? That's some of the things they heard at the trial. Just to set the record straight, Jeremy Del Rey never confessed to killing King. He pleaded guilty. There's a difference if a cop grabbed me and said, I'll kill all your granddaughters if you don't say you took that person to plead guilty. A confession means you have to know some of the intricate details that nobody else knows but the police who was there investigating it and the person that did it. He never confessed. <laughs> this document went into the records. He had probably one of the best defense attorneys that had ever lived in the history of the planet at the time. His defense attorney was called Percy Thorman from Houston. Lawyers used to come in from all over the world and just go to this bar where he used to hang out and just sit and listen to Percy talk. He was James L. Ray's lawyer. James L. Ray was coming up to be sentenced on March the 10th. Here's the letter that Percy Foreman, James L. Ray's lawyer, sent him on March the 9th, 1969. Percy Foreman, Houston, Texas, March the 9th, 1969. Mr. James Earl Ray, Shelby County Jail, Memphis, Tennessee. Dear James Earl, you've asked that I advance to your brother Ray, Jerry Ray, $500 of the $5,000 referred to in the first $5,000 paid by William Bradford Huey on January the 29th. Mr. Huey advanced an additional $5,000 at that time. I had spent in excess of $9,500 on your case. Since then, I have spent in excess of $4,000 additional. But I am willing to advance Jerry $500 and add that to the $165,000 mentioned in my other letter to you today. In other words, I would receive the first $165,500 but I would make 
the advance to your brother of $500. And this advance also is in contingent upon your plea of guilty at the sentencing tomorrow on March the 10th without any unseemly conduct on your part in the courtroom. Here's a man's lawyer that told him your father 30 years ago jumped bail. We're thinking to put him in jail. If you don't plead guilty, I, your lawyer, personally will see to it. You get the electric chair. And, and all the way, we're trying to explain how y'all got all this money so the government is going to say that your brother, you robbed banks, so he's going to jail if you don't go in and plead guilty to him. The jury got this letter from his lawyer, promised him $165,000, but it was contingent on him pleading guilty. Thank God to the King family. Thank God to William Pepper that handled that case. Thank God to everybody out here and the many people that died. His brother was murdered. They said he drowned in the swimming pool. Dr. King's brother, because he was questioning King's death, A.D. They tried to kill Coretta in the church and missed her and killed Dr. King's mother and made like it was some little crazy lunatic guy that came down. And yet, the King family kept on moving. Never born with millions of dollars. Never had the gam glamour that the Kennedy family had. And yet the Kennedy family have spent one nickel trying to find out what had happened to the Kennedys, including that funny little thing that went down with John John last summer. Thank you. And so I say to you tonight, Make no doubt about it, we are in one of the most evil, nasty, vicious, insane, ungodly, unethical systems that's ever existed in the history of the planet.